thank you for being here uh, to celebrate on a cold morning. Uh, we're launching a new series of messages this morning. The title is With. Um, it will be specifically on relationships, and today I get to introduce that topic to you. Uh, we will <clears throat> spend a couple of weeks on marriage. We're going to spend one week on singleness and companionship. Uh, we'll spend one week on parenting, and then we'll, some old guy is going to teach on grandparenting uh, at some point uh, during the series. Should be done about February 13th, and then on the 20th, we're planning on starting our um, new series through the book of Acts. So just so you know, kind of that's the bigger um, plan uh, going forward here the next few weeks. Uh, so good uh, to have you guys uh, here in, uh, in person. Those of you who are joining us online, thank you uh, very much as well. Um, if you've ever, um, if you've ever heard me officiate at a, at a funeral, uh, you probably have heard me say that to me, the most important word in all uh, languages in all time, uh, is the word with, uh, when the angel came to Joseph and Mary and revealed what God was planning on doing through Mary's life, said, you shall call him Emmanuel, God with us. It's interesting. Central to the name of God is with. And uh, so uh, this today, it's an introductory kind of setting a stage uh, for this series um, but I, uh, for, for instance, just, and this is like an add-on, not in my notes. Uh, you think I have notes, don't you, that way? Um, is this passage in Mark chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus had prayed all night, and it says he came down off the mountain, and then he appointed 12 to be his apostles. And he appointed them, it says, to be, what do you think? With him. Well, it's hard to remember. It's hard to remember that phrase in there because we almost automatically go to the after what's after the comma, and gave them power to proclaim the kingdom, and gave them authority over all sorts of evil spirits. But there is no way any human being can proclaim God's word with power apart from being with Him. And there's no way that without being with him that we could have the authority to cast out a demon from someone's life, right? It's all dependent on Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus, it says in John chapter 15, his words, we can do nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We are absolutely dependent on his withness with us. Um, and so that's really what the series is about. Uh, the, the key verse for the entire series is Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, that says, it is not good for man to be alone. This, of course, is a text that's before the fall that's recorded in Ge uh, Genesis 3. Um, but it's not good for a human being to be alone. And so God made another human. And then God made through those humans a bunch of humans. Uh, because it's not good for us to be alone. Um, and so that, that's kind of where we're going. Um, Pastor Chad is sick this morning, so I get to uh, stand in for him and, and open up this topic uh, with you all. And it's an honor. I pray for him. He's sick. He doesn't have COVID. He's tested negative three times, if you're interested in such things. Um, but is sick. And so uh, hopefully he'll get back with us. Uh, soon. Pastor Chad's favorite verse in all of Scripture is Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And it's a, it's a passage about um, the Apostle John and, and uh, Peter. And John and Peter were called before the Jewish leadership, um, uh, and they were going to try to intimidate Paul, I'm sorry, Peter and John from continuing to do the ministry. And so when they're before these religious leaders in that first century, the text says that, that these leaders rec recognized um, that they had such power, but no education, but that they had been with Jesus. 
You see, Jesus makes all of the difference. With Jesus is really the goal. Now, you, you might argue, if I was to say you what, ask you, what is the bottom line meaning, goal of God in Scripture? You might say the salvation of our soul, right? Not a bad answer, right? I think that is our goal. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, it says that you are obtaining the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your soul. That, that's our goal, right? And rightfully so, you know? But the goal of God is to be with you. <laughs> Uh, so so the, uh, the scaffolding has to do with things like salvation. The meat of it all, the building, when you see the, the name on the side of the building that has God's goal on it, it says, I just want to be with you. For instance, if, if we're um, at a graveside, we'll oftentimes hear the passage in John chapter 14, won't we? Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in me, trust in God, trust also in me. For in my house are many places for you to live. And I go and I prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may also be. Isn't it interesting? That the whole purpose of God is to be with us in this life and in the next life. And he's gone and he's prepared a place. I think it's very interesting that John, the author in the John 14 passage, does not say in that text that he builds this place for us to come and worship him. It doesn't say that, does it? He builds this place for us to come and be with him. Oh my goodness. Um... So those are just some of the reasons I, uh, I, for my money, it's the word with. Um, most important word in all of vocabulary in every language throughout history is with. And he's built you and I not only to need to be with him, but to be with one another. He's built us for community. We do not do well alone. Um, Sometimes we wish we, who we could hang out with. <laughs> Let's pray. So Lord, um, help us learn uh, from your word uh, what we need to know as we begin uh, investigating, biblically investigating this topic of with uh, and relationships and, and, and what, is, what, it, uh, what your will is in these things. Father, and Lord, we, we, I guess I just want to recognize in my prayer time that we're, we're here because um, life is so hard. We know it's beautiful at the same time, but it's so hard. We struggle to stay on course and not submit ourselves to the enormous initia of this world. We need strength and insight from you, Lord. Without you, we are driven and tossed by every news cycle. Without you, we're frustrated and we want to remove ourselves from the multitudes that you want us to love with your grace and truth. We want to hit the hills instead of labor in the harvest. So come to us this morning, Lord Jesus. Give us your wisdom. Um, empower us to live out your will and way in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 22, this is what Jesus says when he was pressed as to what the most important commandment is. He says, uh, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. So you could say if someone was to ask you, what is God all about? What is the Bible all about? You could point to these two commandments, right? This is, this is Jesus' answer to what the most important thing is, Would you, right? That's what it says. So the most important thing is my relationship with God, that he desires for me to reciprocate to him the love that he's given to me. He wants me to love him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and might. 
And then he wants me not only to do that, not only to be this, this one directional human being, but he also wants me to learn more and more what it means to love other people the way that he loves me and the way that I love myself. So you could say that the most important thing in the scripture, uh, when it comes to the commands, all those prophets, all that law is to love. Love God and love. And we're not arguing uh, with a human being here, right? We're arguing with Jesus. His answer to the question. The Lord of lords and the King of kings, when he's going to summarize everything, he says, love God with all your heart and love one another like you love yourself. Got it? It's good right now for you to participate in this message. In John chapter 13, it says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Didn't he just say love one another? Well, he's not done. He's going to say it a third time. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Three times. It's almost like Jesus is stuttering a a bit just to get a point across. It's his intention to have people that follow him learn how to love one another. And you're like, that seems simple. (laughs) Right? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Is anybody married? (laughs) Right? I mean, this is the hardest job on the planet for Mary Beth. To love, to love me. It is. Not half as much hard as it is, you know. For, it's, it's easy for me compared to her. I know me. I know my selfish tendencies. Um, it's hard. Right? Life is hard, and this command is demanding. It's a command. <laughs> uh, it's a demanding command. But he wants us. There's, there's no question if you're ever like, oh, you know, I, I need to know God's will for my life. There it is. <clears throat> right? Yeah, but I want to know what job I should have. It doesn't matter compared to this, right? I want to know, where, you know, should we buy that house or not? <sighs> right? We, 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 we want God's will in all sorts of ways. But this one, we're like, ah, oh, you know, I'll, I'll get to that when I get married. <clears throat> oh, yes, you will when you get married. <laughs> Right? Well, then, if this happens, then. And the Holy Spirit right now this morning is saying, no, I want you actually to get after this now. I don't want you to hesitate anymore. This is my clear will for your life, that you love one another deeply from the heart, sincerely, with all of the energy that God gives to you. Love one another. You see, because there's so much at stake, right? The, 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 the end of the John 13 passage is, th- then they'll know that you're my disciples. There's a lot at stake, would you say? And, I mean, and life would be okay if it wasn't for those Baptists, right? <laughs> is he being serious right now? Those of you who are visiting, I'm not being serious right now, Okay. But when it comes to Presbyterians, then I'm going to get serious. <laughs> right? And don't get me started on those Methodists. Yeah. And dare I say, here in the Northwest, Lutheran? Come on. Right? Um, and and we, we chuckle a little bit about this, but boy, it's at another side of it. It's really sad. Would you agree? Yeah. The divisiveness in the body of Christ. <laughs> Let's think about that when we uh, look at a passage out of John chapter 17, uh, the prayer of Jesus Christ. Uh, In in verse 21, he introduces, he pivots in the prayer. He has been praying for the 12 disciples and those who had believed him already. And now he's going to pray, it says in verse 20, he's going to pray uh, for those who are going to believe in him through the word of the the apostles and those first century believers. He's praying for you in verse 20. Uh, beginning in verse 21, that they may all be one. Whew. Who's the all? <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I think you can at least say that Jesus means all the believers, mm-hmm. that they all be one. How are we doing? <laughs> 
Yeah, but Joe, you, you, are you asking me to sell my theological farm just for unity? First of all, you don't own a theological farm. I, that's something I just made up. <laughs> um, the only thing you need to take care of is what God is giving you to take care of. And yes, do you have to have good theology? Don't hear me say no. I mean, you know, this last decade of my life, I've committed to helping some young staff people write their ordination papers. And we study theology and we, we want to understand what God's word says. And we also want to understand what God's word doesn't say. We, we're, trying to, we're trying to root out those things that are just the traditions of men or cultural things that should not be on par with biblical theology. Okay, so, so don't hear me say theology isn't important. Don't hear me say that it's not important that we totally um, have a commitment to understanding good biblical theology. Don't hear me say that, but you could also say that it's at least equally important to the heart of our God that we be one in the body of Christ. And stop debating over secondary issues that are causing us to actually live out in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ's prayer in this passage. And I wish I could go on and on, and I could. Did you bring lunch? <laughs> Maybe supper. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that, here's the so that, and here's why it's so important. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Wow. There's a lot resting on the shoulders of a local church. There's a lot resting on the shoulders of an individual believer in, the, in your sphere of influence. You see that in this, pa in the, in this prayer? So that the world may believe. That's pretty significant. And how, what, what is my part in that? That I would work at unity, peace between human beings, especially in the family of God. How do we do that? Well, first of all, let me comment there. Not well. Most of us do not do this well unless we get our eyes on the prize and have the Holy Spirit come and help us. You cannot do this by your own steam. But there's so much at stake. And so when we do this series on relationships, there's so much at stake that someone else would have the opportunity to believe because we have committed ourselves to working diligently at the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, we're still in the prayer of Jesus, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. This is the prayer of our Lord. This is, this is his heartbeat. It's not, uh, it, it isn't saying anything about theology. It doesn't mean theology isn't important. But what it is saying, we need to pay attention to. Would you agree? Yep. Unity. And so if, if we were to, to do a little study on some of the reasons why there is such a, an issue of unity, one thing would be to do, and I can hear my New Testament professor right now like, be careful, Joe. Dr. Donald Carson, he would be saying to me, careful about what you're going to do right, right here. Um, so I'm being careful, okay? But we're going to both transliterate and we're going to explain the name of the devil, okay? It's a compound name. It has a, it has a prefix on it. Uh, that is uh, dia, and it has a stem to it called balo, okay? And the preposition dia means through in the Greek language. And the 
the, the noun balo in the Greek language means thrower. Do you see the picture? Satan lives to throw through what God has put together. Satan does not want husbands and wives to love one another deeply from their heart. Satan does not want the church family to love one another like Jesus loves us. Do you see this? And so the enemy of the church, the enemy of God, the enemy of your soul is wanting to divide you out from loving other people, giving you excuses and rationalizations why it's okay for you to be an absolute jerk sometimes. I'm going to find another church. He just called me, maybe, maybe he called me a jerk. Oh, we can be, anybody? Okay, the Methodists. They're jerks, right? Not us in this room. <clears throat> My mom and dad are probably listening to this service and they brought me up Methodist, so. <laughs> I can see my mom and dad sitting in their chairs right now. I love you so much, mom and dad. <laughs> I really do. It's sad, isn't it? That we play, we play right into the hands of the devil himself so much of the time. Yeah, but did you see what they did? Did you hear what they said? And Jesus says, I don't care. I want you to love them. I don't want you to show any partiality. I want you to treat other people the way that you treat me, uh, uh, the way that I treat you. I, I want you to actually, when someone's talking to you, I want you to look at them in the eye and I want them to know that you see them and that you care about them and that you're happy that, to be with them. That's what I want you to communicate. Yeah, but they have wrong conclusions about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness. But you gotta love people first. You see, God has decided to change the world, not leading with his wrath, but leading with his love. It's a big risk. Try parenting that way. You'd rather them just like be scared to death of you. I don't care if you love me or not. I just want you to do what I'm asking you to do. You can get loved by somebody else later in your life. Right? Like in Pastor Joe's office. Counseling. I've been in a counselor's office myself. So, let's, let's stop playing into Satan's hands. Let's learn, let's just, first of all, identify the fact this is what he does. And that we've played into it. And then that we've participated at some level, maybe by sins of omission, maybe not sins of commission, but we, 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 there's some things we should have done that we chose not to do for unity. Some things we've done, commissioned, we, we have done things that have caused disunity with, with brothers and sisters in Christ. But can we all at least, in theory, if nothing else, agree that maybe we might have once did that in our life? Can I have a show of hands? I mean, we need to do some exercises right now. Okay, about half of you. That's wonderful. Yeah. What's this? I it's hard, you know, when you get older, you got to stretch that thing out a little bit. Not that you're old. Yeah. The, the name God. Uh, so in contrast to uh, Satan who throws through, who divides, who accuses and brings fear and brings enticement. God, he reveals himself as three in one. It's interesting to me. He wants us to know the triunity. He, he wants us to know that there's, there is one God in three persons. And I think it's a beautiful picture, even though we cannot explain it, of, of the relationship that, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have. Uh, I think it's incredibly um, significant to meditate on such things sometimes. Like, wow, we have a God who is so committed that he's revealed himself in the depths and ways that there's no way we can ever really fully understand or explain it, but that he is a God of relationship. 
And he has mutual submission in the Trinity. It's not like the Father wanting to have his way and the Son wanting to have his way and the Spirit his way. These, our God is a God of oneness. He's a God of unity and he celebrates that. And so this is what happened. Um, Adam and Eve were given one command, don't eat of this one tree in the center of the garden. If you eat of that, you will surely die. It was called uh, the tree uh, that had the fruit, that uh, had the, 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 uh, the, knowledge, uh, what, the knowledge of good and evil. And so here's how the serpent worked and sowed his divisiveness in the human race. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God did say, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was uh, a delight to the eyes and that the tree uh, was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. A little while later, verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and the man and his wife hid themselves. We've been hiding from God ever since. Would you agree? Yes. Yep. Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Here's this relational God. And he's asking that same question if you've moved away from him or really never really given yourself to him. He's calling to your heart right now, where are you? I want a relationship with you. I want you to know how much I love you. And he said, I heard the sound, Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. Not only do we hide, we then begin operating on fear. If there's anything that populates more of our discipleship time or our counseling time with people, it's the issue of fear. Fear of people. Uh, fear of, of not pleasing them. Uh, fear of not fitting in somehow. All sorts of fears drive human beings. And we see this at the, at the, um, the, the foothills, the, the headwaters of our life. Uh, fear is still a thing that's operative. Would you agree with that? Yeah. We hide ourselves and we have fear that makes us make all sorts of bad conclusions all of the time. Can I have an amen in the room? Amen. Anybody ever had a f have a fear that just wanted to overtake you? Mm -hmm. Right? And so that's the result of the fall of Adam and Eve. <clears throat> Who told you that you were naked? God said to Adam, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, <laughs> you know, if, if we're not hiding, uh, if we're not in fear, we're blaming. Do you agree? I wouldn't have done it if their fault. Right? I, I remember our, our son, Seth, I think he was about three years old, still had a, had a what do you call those things? Pacifier, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm old. Um, he was in the back seat, and I was growling at them for uh, he and his sister for something, and um, uh, he pulled that pacifier out of his mouth, and he said, "I didn't do it. Marla was doing it too." <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. I had to not laugh, at least not let him see my laughter in the mirror. Um, right? This is, this is who we are, blaming someone else. And, and it, it's, it's natural to your sinful nature to blame, to hide, to be afraid, and to blame. The man said, the woman whom you gave me, so it's not only blaming the woman, it's blaming. God. Oh, my goodness. You ever done that? Oh, yeah, right? We're like, a little, little bit. 
maybe once, right? <laughs> We're a little bit afraid of that one. Yeah. Mm. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent made me do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Then the Lord didn't ask Satan a question. I think this is, this is telling. He cursed him immediately. Because you have done this, cursed are you of all, above all livestock and above all beasts of the field on your belly you shall go. And dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Hello. <laughs> right? It's right from the headwaters of our faith. It's predicted that marriage is going to be rough. And it's not like us husbands don't know that our wives are right. <laughs> That's the crazy thing about it most of the time. Mary Beth is like, na like hitting it on the nail and I'm like, uh-uh. Or on the outside, I'm going like this, but inside, I'm going, no, you know, wait. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> to the woman, I, I'm going to, uh, you know, the, the childbirth's going to be rough. Uh, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, uh, but he shall rule over you. Poof. <laughs> That's hard. I don't want no sinner ruling over me. <laughs> Right? You have every right to be fear, fearing that. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is a ground because of you and pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth from you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. Verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living let me just pause there for a minute. In the curse, it was like there's going to be enmity between your offspring, Eve, and the offspring of Satan. Um, this is also a, a picture of the coming of Jesus Christ uh, to bruise the head of the serpent on the cross. Uh, we, and we get great vision because we, we live on this side of the New Testament on this side of the resurrection, the death of Jesus. And we can look back on such texts and see, oh my goodness, right from the headwaters of our faith, we are already beginning to see the gospel message. <clears throat> and then verse 21, I think the author of Moses is, is probably unknown to him, but he's giving us incredible information right here. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins sacrificed animals to cover their sin. Interesting. The Lamb of God would come to take away the sins of the world and at the perfect time he came. And so we have this, we have this in, in, in the beginning of, our, of, of the, the scriptures, we have this incredible foresight to what's going to happen through Jesus Christ, that he's on the way already, that before the foundations of the world, Jesus Christ had died for you and, and has chosen you and picked you to come and follow after him. For, from the foundations of the world, the, the Lamb of God has been slain. Does that blow anybody away? It should. God should always blow us away. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall, con uh, shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call him God with us. And then it happened in Matthew 1, we have it recorded. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Christianity is about God wanting to be with us, or it's about nothing at all. Uh, I'll repeat that. 
Christianity has for us the goal of God, which is to be with us, or it's about nothing at all. When Jesus is defining eternal life, for instance, he does not use words that we would, we would think. He says, and this is eternal life, that you might be saved. Is that, what, is that what he says? I'm tricking you, and you can tell. Um, no, he says, this is eternal life, that you might know me. And it's a Greek word, epigonosko, which means to experientially know. That you know in a very real and personal way. All right, well then how, uh, I've decided to entitle my application this way, how then can we live with and not murder one another? <laughs> I know, we laugh at it, but it's, oof. Oof, right? It's a wicked world out there, would you agree? Yeah. Have you ever thought about it? Yeah. Right, Ruth Graham said, never, never thought about diverse murder many times. Talking about her relationship with her husband, Billy Graham. I love that, right? Never thought about diverse murder. <laughs> and so there's, a, there's two steps that I want us to think about when we talk about how then can we live in this loving one another. The first step is always back. The first step is always back. When the Apostle Paul is going to define love, for instance, he says love is... 1 Corinthians 13, think 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is, it's a word we'd like to forget, patient. <laughs> Love always takes a step back first. Interesting. If we're going to learn how to love one another effectively, the way that Christ loves us, the first step is always going to be a step back. Let's look at a passage in James chapter um, four, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Wow, this, that's a great question, isn't it? I'd like to know the answer to that. Really? Okay. Uh, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Wait, it is not my fault that I have quarrels. It is those absolutely idiotic people in my life. And the scripture says, uh-uh. It's that you have passions and desires within you that are quarreling. And so that it goes on to say, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel because I'm not getting my way. And then you pray and you don't get. Um, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, is separation from God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is of no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? He just wants you. He wants to be in a relationship. He's jealous for your soul. That's, that's quite a picture. He wants to rescue you, that, but that's just a midterm goal. What he really wants is he wants to be with you, to love you well and teach you how to love others well. But he gives more grace. Therefore, the word says this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The first step in your, li in your life is always back. Humble yourself under his mighty hand so that at the proper time, he can exalt you. And as you're doing that, just continue to cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. But your first step, if you're going to learn how to love one another well, like Jesus did, the first step is always a step back. All right, you got that? There will be a quiz. The second step is a two-step. It comes from Proverbs chapter 3. And I will demonstrate. No. <laughs> my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Uh, Pastor Daniel, why don't you guys come on up and get, uh, get loaded for some music up here. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not, and here's the two-step, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Steadfast love and and faithfulness. And look at the promise connected to these. 
bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. So here's the reason you do that. You will find favor and good success in the sight of God and people. How? Two steps. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love is a, it's an Old Testament concept. that t- it's, it's a sticky love. It's a love that does not let go. It's the, lo- it's the steadfast love of God that he has for us. And he's asking us to be loved by him in such a way that we learn how to have a steadfast love for the people around us and around us, that, that we're not going to leave them if they fall and if they, they, they make bad choices. We're not going to... We're not going to get rid of them. We're going to move towards them. We're going to restore someone who's caught in some sin with gentleness, looking to ourselves because we're just as apt to be tempted, right? Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. But we're going to be people that, that, that learn from God how to have a steadfast love for one another. Do, do you need someone to have a steadfast love for you? Right? Every human soul is longing for someone to have a steadfast love for them. And faithfulness. People need to know that they can trust you. That you're not going to turn on them. That your word is gold. That you're going to be faithful with the little things, not just the big things. You're going to be faithful with those things, like things that they're just sharing with you, and you're going to keep that as your confidentiality. You're not going to give malice or any gossip. You're going to love them well. You're going to take care of them when they're in the room and when they're not out of the room, when they're not in the room, because you're faithful. You're a man. You're a woman of integrity. Your word stands. It means something. You have the courage to do the hard thing because that's what God has done for you. And so... This is kind of an introduction to the series with. So we're going to get after it together, okay? All right. Lord, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you that it's um, always challenging uh, to us, Lord, when we're um, half awake and, and listening up. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and teach us how to love one another the way that Jesus loves us? Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy and peace and patience and kindness, all those things. But Holy Spirit, would you teach us what it means to love one another. In the name of Jesus.